Hello, everybody. My name is Mike Lagerquist. We are here at Vine Faith in Action. Well, I'm here. We've got people from all over the area, including a couple of our presenters involved with the Master Gardener Program through the Minnesota Extension Service. That'll be Shane Bouchelet, close, I hope, and Joyce Wilcox. They will be presenting on some of the uh, beginning the basics of spring gardening. Uh, they're going to keep it fairly basic. If at the end you have some questions that go beyond what they've spoken about, please feel free to ask the question. Or if it's something that goes off of what they're already talking about, please ask that question while it's fresh in everybody's minds. So in the meantime, I will step aside and let Shane and Joyce take over, maybe start with a, a quick little introduction of themselves. So Shane, I will start it with you. Yep. Uh, so I think you referred my my Cajun name. Uh, my <laughs> my real last name is uh, Shane Bougea. Uh, I am the extension educator for Blue Earth and Lesueur counties. Uh, I have been since 2017. So uh, one of my jobs is to um, help uh, support the master gardeners, such as Joyce, uh, in our in each of those counties that I'm responsible for. And I also answer questions about farms and natural resources and horticulture. So um, so that's that's essentially my my primary job duties. Hi, I'm uh, Joyce Wilcox. I'm a master gardener with the extension program, and I've been with the master gardener program since 2005. Um, and part of what we do is we do coursework, and then the rest of our mission with the master gardener program is to do volunteer uh, work in the community in the teaching people about gardening, sharing information, asking questions, answering questions, making site visits under normal circumstances, pre-pandemic, pre I might say. But we're, we're kind of the garden advocates in the community with the uh, blessing of the University of Minnesota. Today's presentation is an introduction, a very basic introduction to uh, vegetable gardening. Can, can everybody hear me? Are we okay? Am I okay to continue? Yeah, it's a little bit in and out yet, but... Uh... Okay, may I get a little closer. Okay, uh, in this first, there's actually two parts to this. The first part is just a general overview of vegetable gardening, and the second part is container gardening, but today we're dealing with vegetables and not not flowers, it's just vegetables. So in terms of the course overview, we're gonna talk about choosing a site, preparing a site, the water and sunlight needs, choosing seeds and plants, the timing of planting, fertilizer needs, and weed and insect control. So first of all, regarding the site selection, you really need to make sure that the site has at least six hours of sunlight per day. Uh, generally, shady areas will not work. You need to be away from large trees, and the reason for that is because of, obviously the roots will take a lot of your moisture away from you, and you want to be away from walnut trees, and the reason for that, black walnut trees, and the reason for that is walnut trees have a chemical in their roots, in their leaves, in their whole system. Um, it's a, the, the chemical is juglone, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, and prevents a lot of vegetables and flowers from growing, or they might grow, but certainly with vegetables, anything in the nightshade family, and I'll talk about that a little later, will not produce fruit generally if it's near a black walnut tree. I read some places that'll say that if you have a, a walnut tree that's at least, the canopy, the edge of the canopy is at least 70 feet away from where your garden is, that it'll work but that would be a very, very large yard if you had a large tree and you could get 70 feet from the canopy. So my recommendation is it's just a bad idea to try to garden near a walnut tree. The other thing, the other thing will, in terms of the site is you need to consider when you're putting in a garden that you are going, probably going to have to fence it to prevent rabbit damage at a minimum. And then also uh, be close to a source of water. Otherwise, uh, generally in our summer times here in southern Minnesota, you can't necessarily depend on the fact that you won't have to use water. In terms of preparing the site, uh, you need to 
probably, especially with a brand new site, like if you've cut up sod to, to you know, prepare a garden, um, fill it eight to 18, 12 to 18 inches deep, add at least two inch layer of compost or seasoned um, cow manure. You need to break up the clumps and level it with a rake. Um, I think one thing I didn't say about in the last slide about the site uh, choice was, it's really good if you're starting out as a gardener, start out on a smaller scale. I wouldn't go any, I wouldn't like suddenly try to cultivate, you know, a huge area. Keep it, keep it to a, a minimum so that you can kind of get your feet wet, figure out what you're doing and recognize gardening is hard work. You have, you can't just plant it and think, I'm gonna harvest tomatoes in two months. There's a lot of work that goes with it, things like weed control are a lot of times harder than you think. So it's important to try to start small, you can always enlarge it, it would be my recommendation. And then the sunlight requirements, um, you're gonna need at least six hours of sun per day, and preferably that would be afternoon sun. Uh, morning sun is fine for a lot of your you know, flowers and things like that, but most, especially vegetable plants, do require afternoon sun. A minimum of six hours is required. Eight to nine hours is even better. And then in terms of water, you do really do need to uh, keep make sure that you're close enough to a water source. But away from buildings, if there's going to be a huge runoff after a big rainstorm, you could easily have part of your plants, especially in the young stages, flow away. So make sure that you're not trying to dig up an area where you're gonna have a lot of roof runoff. Not that you couldn't save water in a, in a rain barrel or something like that from a runoff and use it on your garden, just don't let it run on its own. And then the last thing to consider about water is we need to be aware of conserving water and a really good way to do that is to make sure that you're mulching your garden. And there are a lot of sources of mulch out there. Uh, you know, many of the, many, basic things work, like a newspaper works as a good mulch. Uh, the one thing I would just say about mulching, and you can go to any garden store and, and find out about what they have around for mulching and what works, but it doesn't have to be expensive. Newspaper works fine. Or grass clippings work just perfectly, as long as the grass clippings aren't coming from a yard that's been treated with chemicals, you know, like for, for, in, uh, uh, for wheat control or that kind of thing, because they, you could actually do killing your plants if you're going to do that. The other thing I would say about mulching is, I know here in North Mankato, the city has a free mulch pile because people continually are, are hauling leaves and branches and various things and the city grinds them up and offers it as free mulch. I would caution you in terms of vegetable gardening to take any free mulch unless you know what it is that was what was ground up. Because with mulch, easily like say in our yard, you've got a big black walnut tree here. Well, we rake in the spring and the fall, we haul off all those black walnut leaves and twigs, and that stuff is getting ground up. Now, for some people, they don't care, depending on what they're using their mulch for, but if you're trying to vegetable garden, don't take free mulch unless you're sure what it's made of. That would be my recommendation. In terms of the seeds and the plants, you need to buy quality seeds. And what I would say about that, it doesn't, you know, if you go to stores now, in fact, a lot of the, a lot of the seed racks are just about empty. I was just checking it at Drummer's Garden Center the other day and some of the really popular seeds are already gone. It doesn't have to be a name brand seed like Burpee or something like that to be a good seed. But the thing that you do probably want to tune into is the seeds, make sure that the seeds are relatively new. Like on the seed package, it'll say packed, for 2021. And even sometimes, well, seeds that are a year or two old oftentimes will work just fine. But if you have had some seeds around for years and you just don't have the heart to throw them away, um, you can plant them and you can, they might come up, but they might not. And if you're gonna put all the work into your seeds, make sure that you do plant a quality, a quality seed that um, is, has a high, pretty high germination rate. And a way to check whether or not seeds are good is to take your seeds wet a paper towel and just seal it up, put the seed in the paper towel, fold it over, put it in a plastic bag and put it in a warm place for three, four days. If the seeds are good, they should start to sprout. If nothing happens, I would just discard the seeds and start over. They probably make good 
bird feed or something, but don't try to plant them because you'll get, you just won't have any success. And if you're um, going the route of have using starter plants, like pe many people do for tomatoes and cabbage and those kind of things, um, peppers, um, make sure that your, your, that your starter plants are healthy to begin with. If you buy them from a reputable nursery or chances are they're gonna be just fine. But you can, if it's a plant looks unhealthy or diseased when you're starting, uh, you know, chances are it is. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't go with that. I wouldn't just, and the other piece that you need to be concerned about is we don't endorse any particular seed house or nursery or anything else. But I would say that some of the big box stores, because I'm, I'm not always buying, but I'm always looking when it comes to garden centers. Sometimes you can tell that plants haven't been watered when they wilt um, due to lack of water or moisture. Probably a bad idea to buy those plants. Oftentimes, if they get to them in time, they'll bounce back. But let me put it this way, it never does a plant any good to dry out and start over. So just make sure you start with quality plants and begin with them and have way better luck. The other thing is the possibility is you can grow your own plants. But again, if you're a beginner, you kind of need to have some things set up at home to start your own seeds. That's a whole nother segment of starting your own seeds. Um, growing them on a Sunday, on a sunny windowsill generally doesn't work that well because what happens is you really don't have enough light and your plants will tend to get kind of tall and spindly. I'm thinking in terms of a lot of people all start to tomato seeds. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. If you have a setup where you can grow it under lights, it will work. If you're just uh, counting on mother nature in the windowsill, you've got a problem with cold drafts, you've got a problem with probably not enough light. You're gonna get tall spindly plants that quite frankly are going to be disappointing. In terms of the timing of planting your garden, you need to be tuned into what the last frost date is for your area. Here in the Mankato area, our last frost date is considered between May uh, 12th and maybe 16th. Um, it's important to note that some vegetables don't care so much, like cool crop vegetables would be considered like lettuce and cabbage, radishes and peas. They can take a quite a bit of cool, in fact, uh, in onions for that matter too. Most of those plants will actually survive a, a real light frost, especially something really thick like cabbage. So you can plant those a little earlier. But again, I, I would make sure that the thing is the soil temperature. And to I, my understanding is the minimum soil temperature that even the cool crop vegetables can maintain would have to be about just under 50 degrees, like 47, 48, 50 degrees. Anything colder than that, what will happen is the plant is probably not going to die, but it's going to linger. And it's not going to really grow till things warm up anyway. And the soil temperature, there's specific needs for specific plants. Your uh, family, your nightshade family of plants, and I'm talking about tomatoes, um, uh, you know, uh, eggplant, uh, peppers, all those plants require a minimum soil temperature of 60 degrees. And again, they won't die, they just won't grow. And they could get they could get stunted from the cold and it just sets the plant behind. I personally never plant tomatoes until at least third week of May, oftentimes closer to the first of June. And I never have a shortage of tomatoes. Uh, it is because tomatoes like peppers and eggplants are heat lovers and they want warm night temperatures. And they do the best, they thrive your evening temperatures, your overnight temperatures are not dropping below 60 degrees. So we're talking summertime plants. And quite frankly, sometimes people get excited about wanting to have the first tomatoes of the season. Well, some of those really early maturing tomatoes, like one I know of, it's called the 4th of July. They really do, really do produce a tomato really early. And in my mind, again, just my opinion, the flavor is more like cardboard than it is tomato because it hasn't had enough time to really bloom. And so I would recommend to get regular season tomatoes and, and plant them when the weather is warm enough and you'll be surprised at how quickly you will actually get tomatoes. In terms of fertilizer, this is always kind of an interesting uh, topic for a lot of people. 
there's a, a bunch of choices that you have. You can use granular fertilizer, you can use water soluble fertilizer, but generally for vegetable gardens, you need a, a, a mixture it's, it's, that you'll see the numbers on the bag. Uh, my picture there, 10, 10, 10 is the chemical makeup of that fertilizer. And what maybe you already know, but just as a little review, what those numbers mean is that the first number, the first is nitrogen, the second is phosphorus, and the third is potassium. Each of those particular nutrients in that, in that uh, fertilizer does certain things for the plant. The nitrogen obviously promotes, well, maybe not obviously, but the nitrogen promotes the leaf uh, growth, uh, you know, that part of it. The uh, middle number, your phosphorus, produces or uh, inhibit, excuse me, the, the phosphorus part of it uh, assists in the, the development a good root, strong root system. And the potassium, which is often called potash, actually um, increases the plant's uh, vitality and resistance to various diseases. Now, in, usually for a regular vegetable garden, a 10, 10, 10 meter is probably what you need. But the other thing that we do recommend if people are, are wanting to do it is to have your soil tested and then you will know what it is that you need. Maybe you are really short on nitrogen and maybe you're not. But you remember for back when I said about choosing the soil, we didn't say you should enhance the soil with compost, which would, would increase the nutrients in the soil. But in terms of soil testing, that can be done through the University of Minnesota. And if you go online and look up the University of Minnesota Extension Service and just Click on soil testing, they have a protocol of how to send your soil in and how to get your results back. That generally, based on the information I saw, uh, I believe it costs $17 to do that. But it'll, it'll give you a printout and tell you exactly what your soil has, how much and how many, and what you would do to enhance your soil. I mean, soil testing isn't an absolute given that you have to do it, but uh, it would be helpful, especially if you're st just starting out and trying to figure out, well, how do I do this and how am I going to make my time worthwhile? In terms of insect and weed control, there's a, a few things, uh, you know, nowadays a, a lot of folks are absolutely would never use any chemicals on their garden. It, in, in my mind, I think it just kind of depends what, what your situation is. Ideally, we wouldn't use any, any weed or insect control but sometimes it's a question of there are more and more environmentally friendly um, chemicals that can be used. Um, the, the big thing, especially if you keep it small, pull the weeds by hand or hold them out. You don't need to put anything on them. I would say that use uh, chemical weed control as a last resort. And again, read the labels to make sure that if you're following the labels, a lot of those things are safe. But a lot of times people think more is better if it says mix one ounce of uh, product with a quart of water, they'll throw it to it to make sure that it kills the weeds. And basically, you're going to kill the weeds a lot more. And so it's, it's very uh, important to use environmentally friendly practices, i.e. read the label. In terms of insecticides, again, it's really important with all the, the information we have nowadays about protecting our, our uh, pollinators, use only environmentally safe products. And same thing with fungicides, use only environmentally safe products. And there are products out there that are safe. Um, so it's, it's I, last year in my garden, I had, we always grow a lot of potatoes. I had a terrible problem with those Colorado potato beetles. And we tried picking them off. We tried a lot of things. And, you know, we'd go back the next day and they were back with you. So um, we ended up, we did, did end up having to um, spray them. But it took a long time for me to decide on what product we could use or that I felt okay about using. And, and we got rid of the beetles, but you know, you just assume, if you can pick off the bugs or whatever, do it. Don't use um, any kind of uh, chemical control unless, in my mind, unless it's the last resort. But again, I would say sometimes it is the only resort. There's not much else you can do. In terms of plant suggestions, um, this, this picture here is a kind of a raised bed situation. And I believe what we're looking at here would be some of your uh, greens, your lettuces, and those kind of early spring crops. Looks like there's some kale in there. That's the 
it's kind of a some choices for warm crop. I'm, what I'm good at going over here now are some vegetables that are relatively easy to grow. Warm crop vegetables like green beans. Um, if you buy a bag of a little package of green bean seed and plant it all, you're going to get enough um, green beans for you and all the rest of your neighborhood. So you don't need a lot of green beans planted a lot of plants to get a really big crop. The other thing I'd say about beans is space out your planting if you can by a week or so between plantings, and then you'll get beans. Those green beans will start to produce probably in, in July, and they'll produce right up through August and into September if you plant them, you know, kind of space out the planting. Um, beets are another really easy one to grow. They're considered a cool crop, so they can be planted a little earlier, you know, again, you know, maybe I would say by early to mid-May, if the soil is warm, beets will grow quite quickly and they, are, they don't take very long to produce beets. You don't want a beet to get as big as a baseball because they just they get hard and kind of bitter. The, the younger baby beets really have a better flavor to them. Some people eat the beet green, so that's another bonus. Cabbage is considered a cool crop, um, very, very easy to grow. The only downside to growing cabbage is um, going to probably have a problem with some um, uh, butterfly damage or you know they can cut with it. In fact, cabbage can have uh, quite a few enemies if you will but there are environmentally safe powders that can be used to deter some of those um, insects from chewing your cabbage. The other piece is it depends on what you can live with. Um, I try to really minimize the amount of any kind of powder I put on my cabbage if it's got a few holes in the they're those leaves off. There's, there's usually plenty of cabbage. They're big producers. It takes a lot of people to eat a head of cabbage. So you, you have to share a little bit with the insects, I think. That's just my take on it. Broccoli is another one that is um, it's a cool crop vegetable, really easy to grow. With broccoli, you have to, they want cool weather. If the weather starts to heat up too much, those, those little green heads will turn into yellow flowers. And they can do it during your overnight if you don't watch it. So you got to notice when to cut them. And once they do start to uh, bolt, that's what it's called, when they start to flower out, obviously that's it's not really something you're gonna wanna eat. It doesn't, doesn't no longer taste like the fresh broccoli that you're trying to grow. And um, carrots are another one that's really easy to grow. They're considered cool crop vegetables. The thing about carrots is they like the soil to be a little sandier. So um, you wanna make sure that you're, that you're not over, over fertilizing carrots uh, and make sure you select, a, a, there's all kinds of carrots. There's the real the, the long, narrow, um, you know, real long carrots. There's also the real short, dumpy ones. And it depends, the short ones seem to have a sweeter flavor. Visually, the long, narrow carrots seem to be more desirable depending on if you're making carrot sticks or whatever, but again, Carrots are really easy to grow, important when you grow with the seed them uh, once they come up, that you actually thin them so they're not, um, you know, growing on top of each other because they'll produce carrots. If, if they're all grown together, they'll produce carrots. They're all tangled together. And it's not a very, not a very desirable crop in the end. And then we have cucumbers. Um, again, easy to grow. They're considered warm crop. The thing about cucumbers is they are susceptible to some mine um, ore damage, um, and, and there are some blights that will affect cucumbers, but generally you get more cucumbers than you could possibly use. The thing is to keep on top of picking them because if you get, if the cucumbers get uh, too big, they just kind of get bitter and lose that really fresh cucumber taste. And of course, here's the opportunity too with cucumbers, easy to make homemade pickles. That's, a, that's another. Uh, that's a whole other class. <laughs> so, and then lettuce, again, it's a cool crop vegetable, but there's all kinds of lettuce. Uh, this right here is leaf lettuce, but there's like endive and romaine. Um, uh, it, uh, there's arugula, there's a fancy salad. There's all kinds of lettuce varieties that you can get. The important thing to remember about lettuce, it needs to be planted fairly early. Once the weather gets too warm, the lettuce gets bitter and it 
starts to shoot up flower stalks, not real desirable or not nice and crisp and flavorful like you're thinking of when you're thinking of having a nice lettuce salad. Onions, again, are considered a cool crop. They can be planted fairly early. Onions are, um, they, need it, they need to be planted fairly shallow and they do need a quite a bit of moisture, but they can't sit in wet ground because they're very, very susceptible to rot. Crown rot is what they get right at the top of the bulb um, where the green comes out of what we call the onion. You could, that'll start to get soft and mushy and they, they won't my personal experience has been with onions is to plant them fairly shallow. You don't ever heat the ground up around them. They kind of like to be growing close to the top of the soil. Um, but the other tip about onions is that they, they freeze well. If you have too many onions all at once that are ready to go, you can chop them up and freeze them. Just put them in a bag in the freezer and they will keep for easily six months. And if you bring them out, they work well for soups and stews and anything other than a fresh lettuce salad with onions in it, they work for everything else. So onions are very, very freezable and, and very, in the wintertime, very expensive in the grocery store. Peas are another cool crop vegetable. Um, the thing about peas, there's, you know, two kinds of people usually grow, you know, the kind where you, it's like peas like you buy in a bag. Um, and then there's also the sugar snap peas, which you're actually, they're pea pods, which you're trying to grow. I've recently started growing a lot of pea pods. Again, they freeze beautifully and they're, they're really, really prolific in terms of the amount of pea pods that you can get off a, you know, like a, a five foot row is, is fairly incredible. They're, they're pretty particular in terms of you got to pick them when it's time. When they're ripe, you got to pick them. You can't well get to it in a few days. It's got to be now. But peas are very easy to grow with a, just the regular, you know, peas or the shell peas. The problem with, with those is you can grow them quite easily, but you have to have a lot planted to get more than a meal out of it because it takes so many by the time you shell the peas. Um, my experience has been they're just not as prolific as the pea pods. So pea pods are wonderful for stir fries and regular peas are delicious, but it seems like a lot of, it take, takes up a lot of space to get as many Peppers again are a warm crop. They're in that nightshade family I was talking about, and uh, peppers are quite easy to grow. My experience has been um, quite disease resistant. There aren't too many pests that bother them. Here you have some um, big bells and some hot peppers. I usually grow about four or five different kinds of peppers because I do a lot of canning and make a lot of salsa, and you need the hot peppers for the salsa. But the big bells, there's nothing sweeter or better than the stuffed pepper in the summertime. In my mind, they grill beautifully. Um, and the other thing about peppers also is they freeze very, very easily. With some of the vegetables I was talking about freezing, you do have to blanch them to freeze them. But with peppers, you don't have to do anything besides, um, like with the big bells, just cut them open, cut out the seeds, put them on a cookie sheet in your freezer, let them freeze overnight and bag them up. And again, they're good for at least six months. And when you uh, use, you can use a pepper, a frozen pepper, and pretty much anything you can use a fresh pepper with the exception of a green salad. They work beautifully from the freezer. So again, it's worth it to plant them. And otherwise you're paying over a dollar a piece in the grocery store in the wintertime. It's just kind of fun to go to the freezer to get out your peppers and use them in the wintertime. It, it, that's me, I, you know, how I see it. Potatoes, again, we grow quite a few potatoes. There's all kinds of varieties of potatoes, the ones, um, but they are a, a, a warm crop vegetable. You have to keep in mind, once you plant your potatoes, you're planting seed potatoes, <clears throat> the, the tubers, the potatoes, are what you plant back in the ground. They take at least three weeks to come up once you plant them. And so you have to be aware of the varieties that you're planting. Um, I always plant some Norlands, early Norlands, because they are the, the fastest to actually get, you know, uh, some product from. Um, usually by late, mid to late July, we actually have potatoes from the garden. The other thing I'd say about potatoes is sometimes, you have, oh, I have some potatoes left from, you know, when I bought a bag and didn't use them all, they seem to be putting out sprouts, maybe I could just plant them. You could. Um, not always with success though, because 
because the kind of seeds that you really need to buy are considered certified seed potatoes, which means they haven't been sprayed with anything that's going to prevent them from sprouting. A lot of times potatoes from the grocery store are sprayed to prevent sprouting, which is great, but uh, they'll prevent them from coming up also. So you're kind of wasting your time. The other thing is if, if potatoes should never be stored in the refrigerator, because what happens is if potatoes are chilled to a certain point for they will, the, the starch in the potato is converted to sugar. There's kind of a chemical process that goes on. And planting potatoes that have been in the refrigerator is not always successful either. Uh, it has to do with the chemical makeup. And so your best, your, really your best idea is to just go buy some seed potatoes. You don't have to spend a fortune on it, but you're gonna have the best luck. If you've gone through the work of digging the hole, putting the potatoes in, just buy the right seed is what I would say. Have radishes, which again are considered a cool crop vegetable. Radishes just about grow by themselves, as far as I'm concerned. You can you just plant them. Uh, don't plant the seeds are big enough that they're easy to plant. Um, plant the radishes about an inch and a half apart, and you don't really have to look at them again until about they, they're usually you'll have radishes in less than a month, less than 30 days, about 28 days, I guess is generally all you need to do is when they look like they're getting big on top, they're getting ready on the bottom. They're a wonderful addition to salads. Uh, just a lot of people just like to put them on a vegetable and dip tray. Um, easy, very, very easy to grow. And again, they'll take only about 28 days. So that's one of your first successes in your new garden is planting radishes. Tomatoes um, are, are the most popular vegetable grown by, by amateur gardeners in this country actually is tomatoes to the best of reading I've done. And tomatoes are definitely a warm crop vegetable. And tomatoes can be absolutely wonderful. What's better than a nice fresh tomato from your garden, that great big tomato flavor. Um, they're, they're wonderful, they're popular, and, but they can be tricky. There's a few things about tomatoes that you need to know. Um, one is they are susceptible to quite a few diseases and problems. And um, Nowadays, a lot of tomatoes have been hybridized to be somewhat disease resistant. And that's, that's really a good thing to pay attention to what kind of tomato you're, you're buying. One of my personal favorites is, they're called celebrity tomatoes. They're not real big. Uh, they're maybe about an eight ounce fruit that you get from the tomato, but they're fairly disease resistant and they're about mid season tomatoes. That's, it, you know, they're pretty multi-use. Um, but if you're planning on, you know, like making salsa or, or canning tomatoes or that kind of thing, you're, there are some other kinds of tomatoes that you're going to want to want to get. The Aroma tomato is really for canning. Um, there's the old fashioned tomatoes like the Big Beef, Better Boy, Better Girl, Big Girl. All those tomatoes are, are wonderful, but they're not necessarily very disease resistant. So you're going to have some problems with that. Uh, a good thing to do if you're buying the plants, you know, the little plants from the nursery is on the label. It should, there should be letters there indicating which diseases they're resistant to. And if you can't tell or don't understand the label, ask whoever is working there would be able to interpret that for you. What are the best tomatoes to buy that are disease resistant? The other thing about tomatoes is you can kind of see the wire in that picture. They have to be staked. Generally, they get too big too quickly and they'll fall down not produce very well. The other one last thing about tomatoes is there are two kinds of tomatoes um, that you can buy. One is called um, determinate, the other is indeterminate. Now indeterminate means kind of like the word that an indeterminate tomato will continue to flower and produce fruit until the plant freezes. A determinate tomato, well, it sets the, the flowers that turn into the, the fruits early in the season. And once all those flowers have turned into to fruit, that tomato is done producing. So if you want to get a long season of tomatoes, you need to pick a kind that's indeterminate. And again, if you're buying the tomatoes with little plants, it'll say on there whether or not they're determinate or indeterminate. I generally uh, plant the, the indeterminate type and have so many tomatoes that I can't use them all. I do a lot of canning. And I, I still give away as many tomatoes as I ever need. So. Uh, it's important to recognize that tomatoes will produce a lot if they're a healthy plant. 
So make sure you've got a neighborhood backup to help you keep them if you're not going to camp. Zucchini, the standing joke with zucchini, again, it's a warm crop vegetable. There aren't many things in my mind much easier to grow than zucchini, but again, you have to have a big family or you have to have a lot of friends to give them away to because they produce so many zucchinis that you can't, even if you start picking when they're really small and use them in stir fries and various other uh, side dishes, there's a limit to how much zucchini a person can use. If you don't pick them or you just stop picking them, you're going to get zucchinis that are going to weigh it would be as big as a watermelon. So you probably don't want that either. So it is, if you're gonna plant a zucchini, uh, don't, don't plant five bushes, plant like two in case one dies because you're still gonna have more than you can use. Generally, you can find people to take them off your hands, but most people won't take more than one or two. So that's my personal experience. So don't, don't plant a whole garden full. That's the, the first part of our uh, um, the presentation uh, Joyce is going to give. And, and I guess this is probably a good time to see if there's any questions in the audience before we move on to container gardening. Oh, Terry, you're muted. You'll have to unmute. Oh, okay. There you go. Is that better? Okay. <laughs> Joyce, the question I have is with that 10, 10, 10 fertilizer. Yes. Do you have to get new every year or if you keep it in your shed all winter long and so on, is it still good? Well, it, you know, I, I don't personally think that fertilizer seems to have a shelf life. It will probably tell you out the bag and it needs to be stored in a cool, dry place and that kind of thing. But I bought a bag of fertilizer, I have to say three or four years ago, it was a pretty big bag and I didn't really use that much of it. And um, I've been using it ever since, but I've got it stored in a good place. You, you don't want it to get wet or anything like that, but in a cool okay. dry place, it's not going to decompose. Right, oh. and, and the, the, one, the, the one nutrient that's going to move, if anything is gonna move, is that first number, that nitrogen. And if you get it wet, or if it gets, you know, into the soil or out there, that's when some of those processes can happen where you could lose that nutrient. But potassium and phosphorus, they really like to stay put. They don't, you know, go in the air or, uh, you know, like nitrogen can if it gets wet and there's microbes. Okay, okay that's good. Thank you. The other, thing I would, the other thing I would say about nitrogen is this, I should have said that earlier when I was talking about that, is nitrogen is obviously, it comes into contact with water and it moves around in the soil. If you have, if you overwater, overwater your garden, or if you have too much rain, the nitrogen will literally leach through the soil and it'll, it'll just keep going downward. And your plant, unless the roots are like prairie grass, you know, two or three feet deep, the plant can no longer access the, the nitrogen. So it's important to to pay attention to that too. And, and the other question I have with your, um, like with tomatoes or with peppers, are they good pot plants? I don't have a good area in my yard to have a garden. They, but they are, they are. In the next segment, we'll, we'll go over that too. Okay. Pardon me? In the next section that we're gonna be talking about container gardening, we'll, we'll point out which plants work well in, in tomatoes and peppers do work well in pots. In pots, okay, good, thank you. I was just wondering, and, and you probably touched on the answer here in the previous part, but what is it that most frustrates beginning gardeners, whether it be something that they are not aware of, or it's just a mistake that they might make along the way? To me, I think a big frustration with people is that um, they, they set some really high expectations and then they, they're disappointed because they thought they were going to can 48 quarts of tomatoes. And they just didn't get that many, you know? And if you have a small spot, you have to have realistic expectations. And the other thing is, I think that people don't realize gardens are work. And they're not, the weeds don't go away by themselves. <clears throat> and if you don't pull the weeds, they compete with the plants and the, the yield you get is just this turns into a big weed bed and you're not going to have much success and then people get disappointed and that's why I said start small have a sharp hole or a strong back and, and make sure you keep, keeping on top of it is the other thing too. Yeah I'd say a time investment minimum 40 hours you know uh, there's there's for a small garden you know that type of thing could be 
starting reasonably just what jo I just want to echo what Joyce said too. Uh, a lot of times people get really large plans. Um, and another thing uh, is uh, they may uh, only plant the uh, plant rotation is going to be important too, as you keep doing your garden, um, you know, and, and things like container garden can be a really good way to kind of, um, if you can't do that, uh, that would be something that might be really uh, useful. But when people, the, another situation I find them uh, find people with sometimes is if they plant peppers one year, the next year they put tomatoes in that same spot. The year after that, they put eggplant. Now those are three different species, but they're all nightshades. They're all relatives. And sometimes when they have diseases, that can spread from year to year. Uh, and there are certain blights, uh, particularly early blight, uh, can happen in tomatoes, especially when some of those um, nightshade plants have been in the same spot for years and years. Even some weeds uh, can also harbor some of these diseases. So it just kind of speaks to the fact that, you know, some planning is going to be important for having a, a successful garden, too. Okay. So I'm going to get the next presentation ready for Joyce. Okay. Um, this, this presentation is a little shorter. It's this container gardening with vegetables and herbs. Just give you some ideas of plants that are suitable and some problems that you might run into. So the considerations would be the choice of the container, the growing mixture, sunlight, fertilizer, water, suitable plants, and mistakes and problems, similar to the, the last overview. In terms of the containers, uh, plastic boxes work, wooden barrels, hanging baskets work, pots and pails work. The big thing to remember about the containers is that you need to have, have holes, particularly in the bottom, and so there could be water drainage. You can't just take a plastic pail and put a plant in it and expect it to survive. There's got to be good drainage so that you can water appropriately and that the moisture, most plants don't want to have soggy roots. So you need to make sure you can put holes and pots. Um, in terms of the growing mixture, you can purchase a potting mixture. You can make your own um, from sand, loam, and peat. Um, and that, that recipe is, you know, pretty much equal parts. And then, of course, you need to fill your pots. So the thing to remember is, you know, sometimes you'll see a potting mixture on sale, and it's it's one of those big two cubic foot, or I, don't know, it's, I think two cubic foot uh, bags. You're thinking, boy, this is really a bargain, but you got to remember you're going to have to lift it and move it to be able to, to fill your pot. So I think that that's a consideration. Uh, in, in, ter in terms of making your own, you know, I don't know, by the time you, you're, you're going to end up having to buy this stuff, I'm not sure that that's really cost effective to do that. Um, but it's important to purchase a potting mix and not one thing that you probably shouldn't um, purchase because I know you can buy it in the, in the greenhouses, is, is just topsoil for potting potted plants is probably not a good idea. It's the wrong mixture. So just be aware of that. Sunlight, um, you, know, you have to meet the minimum needs. And again, even if you don't have, you know, if you've got a, like a, a deck or a, a back step area or something, um, you still need a minimum amount of sunlight. There aren't too many plants that will produce fruit uh, that grow in the shade. There just really aren't. So you're going to need, again, some minimum light needs. Um, things that will grow quite well are leafy uh, vegetables, root crops, and fruiting vegetables. And there I'm talking about um, tomatoes and peppers. Um, the fertilizer needs in a pot are just like they would be in the ground. Again, you probably wouldn't be testing your soil here because you're going to start out with, with potting soil. Uh, but to do the fertilizing, you can either use liquid fertilizer or time release fertilizer. I think for myself in a pot situation, a time release fertilizer is probably a good idea. Uh, again, there's lots of choices. We don't endorse any particular brand, but one that I've seen used quite successfully is called Osmocote. It's a little time released um, like little bulbs and uh, works well. And in terms of liquid, that of course you and liquid fertilizer, you would be using that on a regular basis when you water. The thing about plants in the, in the pot, which is way different than, than having a garden in the ground, is you really need to check daily about your watering situation. When we get into about, you know, the middle of July and we get some of those 90 degree days and a warm wind besides, 
you can have, you can get up in the morning and look at your tomato plants and it's a beautiful pot and everything is looking great. And by, by sundown, the it can be all wilted. Oftentimes when it's really hot and really dry, you're gonna have to water your plants daily. And just to keep them going during this real, real heat period. Now in the ground, your water needs to be more, generally everything would need about an inch of water a week. In a pot, it would, you'd have to check the water daily. But most things don't want to be soggy, so you have to water and then and make sure the water runs through, but then stop. Don't just, you know, just make it into a big sponge. Um, uh, so, you know, you really do need to pay attention to the water. Uh, suitable plants, um, vegetables, be like beans, beets, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, carrots, cucumbers, and eggplant, lettuce, peppers, radish, spinach, squash, and tomatoes. I would say a couple things here, like a viney crop, like say a cucumber, how can you grow that in a pot? Well, you would need to put some sort of a support in there. One thing that would work well would be uh, like a tomato fence. The cucumbers will climb right up it and they will uh, grow very nicely. A lot of people in terms of simple plants like to do, they call them companion plants. They might, um, you know, if they've got a, a tomato growing, they might you know, plant some herbs or something next to it. Uh, you know, things like um, one thing that I don't think is real suitable for for container plants would be potatoes. And the reason for that is to plant a couple of you know a couple of hills of potatoes. You need a five like a five gallon pail, and the number of potatoes you would get from that would be you know maybe two meals. I don't know. It just it seems like. It, Potatoes need, you need a lot more potatoes than what you could grow in a pot. But even tomatoes or any of these plants, you aren't, you, you, the, the suitable container would be a, a large size. Like a tomato would probably very nicely use the five gallon pail um, because it, it needs that much space. It needs to be able to develop its root system. Some of the other shallow crops, like say radishes, for example, your spinach or lettuce, they could be in a smaller container uh, because they don't send out big, heavy roots, like not like uh, tomatoes would. Um, mm -hmm. Things like uh, cabbage, again, they wouldn't need quite as much space, but they have a pretty sturdy root system once once they get going. So it's just kind of kind of thing to remember is tomatoes in particular, because that's the most likely plant that anybody will put in a pot. It needs to be as big as a five gallon five gallon pail, and you need to have a fence or a tomato cage to hold it up. Otherwise, it'll probably tip over. I'll be unhappy and so will the tomato. Oh. Um, beets and uh, baby carrots grow well in, in pots. Um, and oh. and the, the baby baby carrots would be, you know, those kind of became trendy in the last few years, but there really is such a thing when you go look at your seeds, um, buy baby carrots. They're, they're not going to be the kind that are six inches long. They're more like about three inches. And beets are also, you can find baby beets. They produce a much smaller vegetable and many people think it's a much sweeter vegetable. So it depends on what you're wanting to use it for. Beans will grow well in a pot. Um, again, you know, even out of, a, out of a small pot, you can get a, quite a few beans. You're not gonna get enough to put in your freezer probably, but you can get certainly a few meals. The thing about beans is once they start to flower, they'll continue to flower. For, for certainly several weeks, but you need to continue to pick the right beans, waiting for every every little thin bean on the plant to be ready. It's going to be disappointing for you because some are some are going to be you know as big as a cucumber before the small ones get ready. So if you continue to pick them, as long as the plants are healthy, they continue to, to push out flowers for certainly two to three weeks at a minimum. Peppers and cabbage. Um, I love to grow cabbage. We love uh -huh. we love to um, have coleslaw. Uh, but the thing about cabbage is it's, it is a one trick pony. You plant cabbage, you get a head of cabbage and that it's not, you don't, it doesn't produce any more than one head of cabbage. Sometimes at the end of the season, they'll send out like little teeny volunteer heads, but they never, they never mature enough to be able to use. Peppers, again, peppers, if you can, peppers need to be picked on a regular basis. And uh, if you continue to pick peppers, they just will continue to bloom. Uh, 
I've had peppers that I was picking late into September because we kept picking and they just kept producing. If you have a good, sturdy, strong um, California Wander is a, is a really good pepper to grow if you want nice, big, sweet green peppers. They're so wonderful, wonderful peppers. Uh, 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 Park, Park's Whoppers are another one that peppers that grow really, really well and they're prolific in terms of the amount of peppers you can get from one plant. Cucumbers and eggplant, again, well, uh, cucumbers in particular will grow nicely in a, in a a pot, um, kind of a, maybe a long shallow, more shallow pot for cucumbers would be good. So you can put a trellis in there because they really do have to crawl. If you don't let them crawl out, up, they'll crawl out and you'll have cucumbers all over the place. Um, it, it's, it's just not a, a good situation. You want them up in the air so they stay healthy and you can easily pick them. Eggplant is uh, in the uh, nightshade family and eggplants are really they don't look like they would be, but they're really easy to grow. I think the thing about eggplants is a lot of times people don't know what to do with them. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's a lot of wonderful Italian recipes with uh, eggplant in them that are they're, they're wonderful. And eggplants, once they start to produce, um, again, you're going to have to have friends to give them to because there's a limit to how many eggplants a person can use. I love them in stir fries and eggplant parmesan those kind of things, but again, there's a limit to how many you can use, so make sure you have friends if you're going to be gardening to look some of these vegetables. Lettuce, again, um, lettuce is very, very, very easy to grow. Um, and once you, it's a cool crop vegetable, though, so once, you know, this lettuce looks like it could be ready to start using it, what you do is, what I do is take a scissor and cut off the leaves, don't cut them down to the ground, leave some leaves down and it'll regrow several times before it starts to bolt and send up seeds. And they do like cool weather. So if it gets too hot, lettuce is definitely a spring vegetable. You can plant lettuce again in the fall. Uh, I would say around the 1st of August, you can plant lettuce and get another crop yet that season. Uh, it, it takes about 30, 35 days to get, depending on the kind you planted to get lettuce. Um, and there's, a, there's a lot of good varieties of lettuce out there, uh, seed that produce various colors and various nutritional value. Just plain old iceberg lettuce, you know, like the heads that you buy in the grocery store, that it, it's, it, while it's tasty and crunchy, it, the nutritional value in lettuce is, uh, you may as well you know, eat a piece of cardboard, there's nothing in it, it's just water. So you, you would probably want to branch out and, and, uh, and you know, use some of these lettuces that actually have some nutritional value. If they have a little color to them, chances are there's more nutritional value, but iceberg is kind of not worth your money. You get more out of the dressing than you do the vegetable there. Peas, again, peas, I, I, if you're going to plant peas in a pot, I would strongly recommend only plant the, 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 the full pea pod, the pods. Planting peas, thinking you're going to get a big harvest out of a pot, or eating just plain peas, you have to have a lot of pots and you'll be quite disappointed. So sugar sugar snap is the kind that I would recommend. And again, you'd be eating them for the pea pods, which are, by the way, very, very high in fiber. They're a very healthy vegetable to be eating as a snack. You know, on that vegetable and dip tray, having some pea pods, as long as you're not eating the dip, they're really good for you. Potatoes and radishes. You can radishes are, you know, grow really, really easily. I said earlier, potatoes, I, you know, you can grow them in a pot and they definitely will grow, but if you've got a limited space and a choice of what to plant, potatoes wouldn't be at the top of the list because you don't get that many potatoes out of one pot. And in the scheme of things, is it worth my time and effort if I'm going to get like five pounds of potatoes altogether? That's not much, but that's certainly just my opinion. They will definitely grow in a pot. Um, there's, there's no doubt about it. Tomatoes and zucchini. Um, again, zucchini in a pot will do beautifully. You'll get more zucchini than you can, you can use. Tomatoes, a lot of people like to plant the, um, you know, the baby, various baby varieties of tomatoes. Uh, you know, sugar plum, or I can't even think what the names are for sure. Cherry tomatoes. Uh, 
and again, the, the thing to keep in mind, if you plant cherry tomatoes or that real small, they are wonderful. They're usually really prolific. And again, you're going to be, don't plant like five plants because you're going to get so many cherry tomatoes that you can't probably eat them all. They're really only, at least I shouldn't say only, but they're generally suitable for fresh, eating fresh and salads and that kind of thing. They're not really good for canning or preserving. So you're going to be stuck with a lot of tomatoes. They are, they are prolific producers. So I would recommend if you're going to go with tomatoes, pick out a slicing kind like a celebrity. And you're going to get a lot of nice tomatoes for you. Easy herbs to grow are uh, basil, parsley, and oregano. We caution you about it, you know, the, the basil and parsley will grow on a pot. You can even you can actually even grow those in the house. They're very, very easy. Oregano is another story. Oregano is so prolific that if you plant it in the ground or if you have it in a pot near ground that's suitable for, <laughs> for growing things, it and if you would by chance happen to let some of it flower, it'll the seeds will go all over your yard and you're gonna have oregano coming up all over the place for years. Oregano is something that, you know, it's a wonderful herb. It's fabulous in Italian dishes. You can cut it and dry it and grind it and all kinds of things you can do. Eat it fresh, put it in salads, but you got to keep it under control because once it escapes from the pot, the roots go crazy. And I planted oregano in my uh, impound garden here, uh, I want to say seven or eight years ago. And um, I've been trying to get rid of it for seven or eight years and I keep pulling it out and it keeps coming back. So it's, it's really prolific. So you've got to, it's kind of like, I guess like mint. Uh, you you got to really keep her under control because the roots just won't go away. So some mistakes that people make with container gardening. You got to fill the container in the right place. And that's where I was talking about. Don't buy an 80 pound bag of soil thinking, well, this will work. First of all, you won't be able to get it out of the trunk, let alone pour the soil out. So you're buying smaller containers. And another thing is don't drown the plants don't underwater the plants um, and don't have uh, a poor plant to pot ratio. In other words, don't try to use little teeny one quart containers and think you're gonna grow a tomato plant because it won't happen. You need to buy healthy plants and seeds to start with. And don't be afraid to prune things back, particularly like tomatoes. When they start getting too leafy and you think, well, this is all I've got is greens here. I, you know, it's, it's okay to, if there's some nuisance branches, just trim them off, they're gonna be fine. Um, another thing is plant uh, good companions with with you know your tomato your tomatoes for example a good herbs are a good companion uh, for those like basil for example works well with tomatoes. Um, mm -hmm. Don't starve your plants in, in pots in particular unless you've used a time release fertilizer. Uh, if you're using a liquid fertilizer, make sure that you're fertilizing on a regular schedule. I would say about every ten days, especially. In in the summer. And then the other thing is with containers, don't have unreasonable expectations. You know, you're, you're, if, you, if you have just room on your patio for a tomato plant and maybe a cucumber and a, and a pot of beans or something, you're going to have enough for a few meals and it's going to be real fun to have or some lettuce is going to be, but you're not going to fill up your freezer with, with vegetables. And so have reasonable expectations. Um, the other thing, I don't think I mentioned this. I, I didn't, didn't list this on here. One thing that, um, and we're going to get into some problem, but one thing I didn't address here that can be a major problem with potted gardens in particular is um, problems with squirrels. If you live anywhere in, in town, if you live anywhere near a black walnut tree, you're going to have squirrels are cute, or they used to be cute to a point. They'll dig everything out. Um, so there's, there, there's some precautions you would need to take to prevent squirrels from ruining your garden before it ever really gets started. Um, there are some um, natural products that you can buy that supposedly will, will keep squirrels from digging out your plants. Um, I have never had great success with those. Uh, in many cases, the reason is you have to keep reapplying all the time. They're organic, they're not gonna hurt anybody, but you have to apply so much that at the end, you spend a hundred dollars on squirrel prevention and you got four tomatoes. It's, you, gotta, you gotta see whether or not that was really worth it. 
Um, one thing that you can do, like with tomatoes, for example, you know that uh, you can get you can buy bird netting that people will throw over raspberries and that kind of thing. If you drop a bird net over a tomato cage, generally it'll keep the squirrels from grabbing your tomatoes or trying to dig your tomatoes out. Um, another thing that will work, depending on what plant it is that you're you're using, is I've used um, woven wire cloth. Put it in the top of the pot and cut a you know snip the hole in there and put uh, drop my plant in there. The squirrel hops on it and tries to dig out the plant and all of a sudden it can't dig the wire and it works. I've done that um, for a lot of years with a lot of my flowers in particular, but because they're for, forever after our, our flowers here because of the walnut tree we have in our backyard. Um, but again, you, you can have a lot of problem with with squirrels. The other thing that will work also is if you take, if you have, you know, like a Lake Superior and those nice big flat rocks that are on the shore, those kind of like, I guess those are actually called river rocks. If you have access to some river rocks, if you line the top of the pot with rocks, squirrels aren't that powerful. They can't, they can't push them out of the way. So it deters them from trying to move them around. And you can't, you've got to have rocks that are a pretty good size. They can't be just like a little pebble. You need to be Oh, about uh, maybe half the size of your fist. A squirrel isn't really that strong. They can't move them. I've had good success with that. But again, that's just something that I learned um, over the years with being my frustrations. The other thing that is, is going on with a problem would be if you have deer, if you're living in a real wooded area and there are deer in your neighborhood, um, I don't, you know, I'd say good luck <laughs> unless you have a real high patio or a high you know porch up, up way up off the ground because if you're gonna try to plant things in pots and you have deer in the neighborhood well they're gonna it's gonna be a, a garden salad for them they're just gonna come by and eat it all to the ground and with most of these plants you can't really except for leaf lettuce you can't cut it back to the ground and expect it to come back so deer can be a real real problem and in that case, you might want to go to hanging baskets if you can have them up high enough. But you know, I don't know, trying to grow a garden where there are deer around, in my mind, is you're really kind of setting yourself up for failure. Plus, the other pieces that are their products that you supposedly can buy that, that will supposedly deter deer. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Very, 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 very expensive because in many cases, you have to apply them after every rainfall. Well, again, do the math. If you're going to spend that much money on deer prevention, you might as well just go to the grocery store and buy a tomato. I mean, it's, that's just my opinion, but again, that's the reasonable expectation things. Unless if you have deer, you're going to have problems. I guess that would be my final word on that. Um, to get to what the screen is looking at now about uh, problems, potential problems, over fertilized tomatoes will produce a kind of a mess, like you see at the, on the screen there. Lots of leaves, but you don't see many flowers and uh, they'll grow into uh, kind of a big mass but they don't produce very much. Overwatered plants um, will usually turn yellow the, all the nutrients kind of leach, leach out of the soil and uh, they sort of turn yellow and, and look, they look like they're being tortured and they are plants that are overwatered generally. Root rot is another thing that'll happen. Um, these are sugar beets. Again, this would be a situation where you, you were overwatering your pots and they were they didn't have good drainage and they won't, um, they'll just rot. They can't make it. There's the uh, rot and blight that will occur. And that's a tomato leaf there. Uh, you know, I was kind of, um, Shane mentioned it early on when he said that you can have problems if you keep using the same soil that some of these diseases will carry over in the, in the soil. Um, I think is that that's probably what this particular disease is, septorial leaf spots or something. I think that's what that one's called. Um, Could be, yeah. but the thing about it is there are some uh, fungicides that you can use to prevent these and they're not all even bad for the environment. But it's best to buy plants that are resistant to some of these problems. Um, this bean plant over here that's sagging on the side of your screen, um, that, 
that rot is due to usually overwatering tolerate being in, they want moisture, but they want it to be in and out and not soggy. And this plant here, which I think that's probably a marijuana plant, <laughs> I'm not really sure, but uh, looks like it is. Uh, that's a situation where it's underwatered and it, it kind of will droop down like that. It, it, it does, never does a plant any good in its life cycle to let it droop, get underwatered. It just doesn't help <laughs> because it, it, it'll come back, generally it'll come back, but you do that a couple of times and a number of times it'll come back. Instead of using its energy to produce the fruit that you want, it's gonna use its energy trying to come back to life. So it's really gotta make sure, and like I said, on a hot summer day, you have to check those pots daily. And I think that's the end of that. Yeah, and, and, and to kind of uh, another thing if, uh, related on the disease aspect when you have containers, one thing you tend to see quite a bit on peppers and tomatoes, and Joyce, you might see this too, uh, is a disease called blossom end rot. Um, and sometimes when we have a container and we are worried about watering too much or too little, oftentimes that variation where it gets really dry and really wet and there's not a consistent uh, schedule on some of these uh, container plants for peppers and tomatoes, you might see the fruit uh, start to rot on the bottom. Uh, it almost look like a black sunken area. So one of my kind of tips is if you're looking for container tomatoes and peppers is, is see if that uh, variety has resistance to uh, blossom end rot because there are certain varieties that can uh, hold up better uh, against those types of diseases where it might be, now the cause of that issue is, is kind of complex, but um, one of the things is, is that it's, it's related to a calcium deficiency in the area, but that's not because of the soil. The soil could have plenty of calcium, but due to the stress on the plant, uh, it can't absorb it efficiently into the, into the plant itself. So it might show symptoms of calcium deficiency, but the soil might not be deficient in calcium. So that was one of the kind of the issues that I, I see sometimes with uh, containered uh, peppers and tomatoes. One other thing I would add about tomatoes and, and diseases is, you know, I was kind of dissing uh, uh, cherry tomatoes because they produce so many, but they're more resistant generally to some of those blights and diseases. Uh, mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're just trying to make a salad and want tomatoes all the time, then I would go with the cherry tomatoes and they are, they are way more disease resistant. But again, I would say if, as far as a disease resistant tomato, I think your celebrity brand or celebrity variety is one of the most disease resistant that I've I've really encountered. They're they're wonderful. Mm -hmm. Any other questions that anybody has? No, but it's been very informative. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all very much for for being here. Now I expect you to all go out and plant. Uh, <laughs> Me, I've got I've got two big black walnut trees in my backyard, so there's not a whole lot of hope. My I don't have enough to go 70 feet away or whatever that distance was. So uh, I will be visiting the produce section of my local grocery store. <laughs> yeah, plus, plus, then you also probably have a real squirrel problem too. I would imagine, you know. And it's again, that was we've been I've been fighting squirrels, you know, here for lived here for like 35 years, and from day one. So we, we've made progress, but again, that's why I'm using anything I can think of to, to try to keep squirrels at bay. They have a right to live too, but, but they move next door as far as I'm concerned. I was like, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, squirrels and rabbits both. Yeah. <laughs> All right, are there any other questions before we, we thank Joyce and Shane and, and let them go on their way? I hear there's a verdict that's about to be announced at about 3.30. So, really? Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. Uh, so any other questions before we go? No, thank you. If not, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you very much to, to oh, Joyce so and Shane. Yeah. Very, thank you. very informative, especially for somebody like me who knows next to nothing to begin with. Uh, it, <laughs> it, it gives me a good starting point if I were to uh, take that on as a, as a challenge, which it sounds like for me it would be. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, and to everybody else, take a look at uh, bindvolunteers.com. We will have this video posted there. Uh, 
by tomorrow for sure, I'm guessing. So just go to our virtual Vine section of that. So Shane, Joyce, feel free to, to direct your friends or uh, acquaintances there if, if they're looking for this type of information as well. Okay.